Hello everyone, Pastor Dan. It is Tuesday, June 9th, and I uh, wanted to uh, get back into the, the habit of, of doing uh, some midweek devotional time, and I uh, hope this has been um, useful and a blessing to, to many of you. We spent a good amount of time going through uh, Thomas Brooks' Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices, and I commend that book to you. You can find it uh, for, for pretty reasonable uh, prices online in O Banner of Truth, um, which is the world's finest publisher, in my opinion, publisher of uh, Puritan Works. Um, they have a, a, a paperback reprint of that, and so you don't need to buy uh, the five-volume set of, of uh, Thomas Brooks' works or anything, but uh, you can get it for about ten bucks, probably. So I commend that to you, and uh, Brooks delves into other issues, uh, beyond just kind of those those initial uh, issues of, of uh, sin and temptation in the Christian life. Uh, so now thinking about uh, our next steps in these midweek devotionals, and um, I, I thought that it would be um, useful and helpful to, to take a, a step in a more um, theologically or um, God-centered theological direction. Uh, certainly issues of the Christian life are all centered around God and His doctrine, but um, specifically to think about the doctrine of God uh, for, for a while. And so with the limitation of these videos, we're not going to be able to, to get uh, too, many, uh, too many levels into, into depth. But my hope is that we can give some background and uh, some some initial information from the Bible, some truth from the Scriptures regarding some of God's attributes and who He is, and an encouragement uh, to uh, to to go further in your own in your own uh, devotional and study life. And that's really my hope for for all of these videos is that it it awakens in us a uh, a, a sense of our spiritual hunger and a desire to grow. Um, in our knowledge of God. And that certainly begins in a primary way with what we think about uh, in terms of who God is and, and what kind of a God He is and, um, and His attributes, what He's like. So today, just to introduce that subject a little bit, I wanted to think about a couple of things together. And, and um, I'm using a couple of the reference works that I'll be using as we go through, as I'm using... Um, Stephen Charnock, a uh, great Puritan, uh, he wrote The Existence and the Attributes of God. Um, classic work and fantastic. Um, and, and so I'll be using that as a somewhat of a primary reference. Um, I'm usually using Abrockel's The Christian's Reasonable Service. Uh, so he's a Dutch later Reformation um, figure, and his systematic theology is, uh, is wonderful. Thomas Watson also has a work on the attributes of God that is very helpful and practical, so I'll be using that as well. Uh, but Charnock's work starts off, as uh, and certainly most systematic theologies start off, with the question of the existence of God and, and, and a discussion on, on God's existence uh, in himself. And, and that this is a, this is a, foundational, uh, a foundational issue. So to think about that today, I'd like to read uh, from Psalm 14. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. Have they no knowledge, all the evildoers, who eat up my people as they eat bread, and do not call upon the Lord? There they are in great terror, for God is with the generation of the righteous. You would shame the plans of the poor, but the Lord is his refuge. O oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores the fortunes of his people, let Jacob rejoice, let Israel be glad. This psalm is uh, it, useful for discussion of, uh, of multiple things. I mean, think about universal sinfulness and accountability towards God. Where God looks down on the children of man to see if there's 
there's anyone who is who is ultimately righteous, and God does not uh, does not see anyone meriting salvation in and of themselves. The Apostle Paul will use this psalm later on in the book of Romans when he is explaining his doctrine of sin. But uh, today I'd like to focus on the fact that this psalm says that he is a fool who says in his heart there is no God. So that is uh, what we might term atheism, and it. It doesn't seem to be, and the scriptures don't usually give most of their attention uh, to someone who is sort of an academic atheist, someone like uh, Richard Dawkins today, who, who writes books to sort of to, to try to intellectually prove, though his books lack a, a great deal of, uh, of intellect, to try to intellectually prove uh, that God doesn't exist, right? Those who sort of publish that that lack of belief. I don't believe in God. There, certainly there are more of those people in our world today than probably there's ever ever been, and, and we should take time to think about that. But the bigger problem is what the, what the scriptures describe, um, and we could use the, the, the title of practical atheism. That's what the scriptures seem to be most concerned with. Someone who denies God's existence by living without consideration to him or without reference to him, living a life that doesn't really touch upon the foundational issues of your being a creature, of God being uh, your God, your King, your Lord, um, or living in a way uh, and speaking in a way that misrepresents him in your in your heart and in your life. So if you if you take on lies about God. Uh, not only is that idolatrous, but that also has a, a form of practical atheism because you're, you're not believing um, what the scriptures tell us about God. You're not, and perhaps you're rejecting things that, uh, that nature tells us about God. We'll talk about that a little bit in just a couple of minutes. So this is, uh, this is a, a practical atheism most often. And it's a corruption of the heart, right? The fool says, in his heart there is no God. So we've talked about the human heart, which is you know, the mind, at least the mind and the affections and the will, um, other things as well, but these faculties that constitute our inner life. And I'm, what I'm trying to do with these videos is awaken in us a sense of, of our own heart and that to be a servant of God, to be a good Christian, we ought to be thinking about these things. I have a soul. I have affections deep within me that uh, sort of point me towards either more or less service to God. And so to have unbelief is, is to be corrupted in your heart. Notice also that there is almost a seamless connection between the corruption of the heart and the corruption of the life, right? To, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. Um, they do abominable deeds, right? They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds deeds. There is none who does good. And and that's really where we see probably the fullest description of, of something like practical atheism. Uh, practical atheism is usually an issue that comes down to denying God's providence and his sovereignty and his government of the world. What do I mean by that? Well, uh, someone who lives with no concern about judgment, with no concern about standing before God, with no concern about uh, the accountability that they have towards their words and their actions, that is someone who lives practically as an atheist. They, they may as well come out and say that they don't believe in God because you, you can tell by their lives that they're not concerned about such things. And if you're not concerned about it, then you, you obviously don't believe it. So to, to live as if God is not the judge who sees all and who will bring all to light and who sees human hearts, that is to be practically an atheist. Listen to what Charnock says. Those that deny the providence of God do in effect deny the being of God, for they strip him of that wisdom, goodness, tenderness, mercy, justice, righteousness, which are the glory of the deity. In other words, God has revealed himself to us in his word. He's told us that he is all of these things. He is good. He is tender, merciful. He is just. He is righteous. He is wise. Um, all of these 
connecting together to show a God who is who is sovereign, who is mighty, and uh, if if we if we live as if that is not true, then of course we're denying uh, we're denying God's existence in a sense because we're just saying whatever He's revealed about Himself, I choose to uh, to not live that out, and and often how how simple it comes down uh, we can see it comes down to to issues really of of wanting to live uh, for your own desire for your own pleasures this is what charnock points out right? that that essentially people desire to live in uncontrolled uh, lusts and and that induces them to denial of providence it's a convenient uh, truth or untruth depending on how you're looking at it right for someone to say well uh, I just reject that God's going to there may be a God out there, but I just reject that he's going to bring all of my actions, good and evil, to light. Uh, that's a convenient truth for those who want to live for themselves, for those who want to live uh, for their own desires. Um, and so they, they, they stifle a proper fear of God so that they may chase after um, their sinful pleasures. How does one come to be... Um, an atheist in this kind of a way. Right? What are the dangers that, that we need to be aware of? Well, uh, thinking and doubting is one thing that uh, that can produce in people uh, when it's done in the wrong way. Of course, thinking is, is a good thing, but, but thinking about doubts or entertaining doubts, um, that's one way in which we can be brought uh, to this kind of practical atheism. Sort of convince ourselves, kind of get in this loop of thinking and rather than going outside of our own thoughts to God's thoughts and to God's word, we we sort of stew on uh, on things ourselves. Then uh, wishing that this is something that um, that I've seen in, in in people that they really can wish so hard that God is a certain way that eventually it just becomes real to them. And I want God to be this way. I want God to be a God who doesn't condemn, who doesn't punish. And eventually, that's that's the uh, the untruth that they accept. And uh, uh, the reason that this is so important to think about, sort of at the beginning of all of these things, is that uh, it's so crucial to have a firm conviction of the existence of God, in order to be able to follow along the path in any sense past this question in a way that pleases God. So you have to have this foundational issue settled. Uh, so one theologian says, we must first believe that he is, and that he is what he declares himself to, to be, before we can seek him, adore him, and de devote our affections to him. We cannot pay God a due and regular homage unless we understand him in his perfections, what he is, and we can pay him no homage at all unless we believe that he is. So our, our faith, our spirituality, they will go nowhere unless we believe that he is. This doesn't mean that there will never be any sense of, uh, of a doubt or sort of a, a sense that your, your faith is weaker one day than another. That's part of human, human existence. We'll talk about that in just a minute. But there needs to be a, a firm conviction that God is and that he exists and that he is the God who is, is like what he, exactly like what he reveals himself to be in his word. Why does the Bible describe uh, such people as fools who uh, deny the existence of God most of the time in their lives? Well, because it's, it's to imagine or to declare something, to declare to believe something that is so contrary to universal reason uh, for the rest of the world. The, the, if you look at all uh, human civilizations and societies um, throughout the history, the known history of mankind, there has always been a, a majority of people who recognize a supreme being. Uh, so it's folly to go against the flow of humanity, even though we live in this, this age where there is the, this, this trend of the new atheists, and there are many atheists who have published over the years um, you think of Bertrand Russell in the mid 20th century, and then kind of many uh, who have kind of followed in his tradition, and there were others before him as well. 
But even with all of that, it, it fails to gain footing as a majority opinion in any society. Uh, most people believe in a supreme being, a, a god. The, the issue is that um, most people want to fashion God uh, in their own mind and in their own heart, and they want to sort of adapt it to their own life. So uh, the first folly is that you, know, you would deny um, what universal reason shows us to be true, um, and then when you realize that, okay, so most people believe in a supreme being, then it's folly to decide that you're going to fashion God according to your own liking. That, that makes God subject uh, to you. And that is foolish. Uh, that is uh, the fool who says in his heart there is no God. You think of Psalm 10, uh, that speaks in more direct ways about the foolishness of thinking that your actions will not be brought to light, that God will not judge. Um, so you kind of take those two things together. Romans 1 says that God's eternal power and his uh, divine nature have been clearly seen since the creation of the world. Right? He puts it on display. Every creature that you see, every plant that you see, when you look up into the skies at night, when you see the heavens, all of those things declare to us that there is a God. He is eternal, he is powerful, and he makes it plain to us. With that universal recognition of truth, that, that, that all people, all societies, really, and the majority of all societies have always held to this, um, to then make the, the next step in a, in, in a very subjective way and, says, and to say, okay, well, now I'm going to just live uh, by fashioning God according to my own mind. Uh, right? that, is, that is a foolhardy endeavor. And then, uh, then one more thing, and then we'll talk about some practical issues. Uh, we have to understand that as we seek knowledge of God, and understand the importance of acknowledging his existence, we have to understand uh, that we ought to have a centrality of love towards God. We, we must love him. Right? The one who does not love God, in a sense, denies him because we deny who he is, a God of mercy, a God of grace, a God who has loved us first. Um, the person who does not seek to know God in the context of loving him, really introduces himself into a greater danger of atheism. Um, someone who has a, a slavish fear of God, a terror of God, will be all the more tempted to convince himself that various lies about God are true. Right? If, if you think about God as a, as a tyrant, as one who... Uh, glories only in his punishment, in his wrath, that you cower in fear of him, that you have no joyful fellowship with him, and if you're seeking just sort of a bare knowledge of some of the things that he is and ha has revealed himself to be, you, you introduce yourself to a greater danger of atheism. So it's very important that when you seek to know God, you're doing so in the context of loving him. So with all of that, then let's think about just a couple of, of things that, that uh, become our duty in, in this endeavor of knowing God. And in the, pre, in the future uh, videos, we'll talk about specific attributes of God that help us know Him more, reflect on Him in a, in a more sanctified way. Um, so the first is this. It's just we need to progress in our knowledge of God. Right? The, Peter says this at the end of Second Peter. They grow in the grace and the knowledge of of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Grow in grace, grow in knowledge. We need to be built up. We're, we're living stones. We're rooted and, uh, and built up in God. So we're like plants, but we're also like bricks. But uh, even when we're described as bricks, we're often described as living stones. That we're, we're, we're growing. So we need to be growing in knowledge. It's not good to just sort of uh, say, well, I know enough now. Uh, there was a, uh, when I first uh, graduated seminary, there was a guy at the church where I was serving, and I was just uh, an, an intern, um, an interim type figure. And, uh, and he said, well, I don't go into sermons anymore because I've heard them all, right? And, and, I, and, and I, didn't, I, I didn't really have the, the confidence at that time to sort of call him out on that thinking. But what a terrible way 
uh, to, to think about the Christian life. There, there's always stuff that you need to learn. There's always stuff that you've forgotten, and, and you need to learn more of it. You need to always be, be growing. The second is this. You need to suppress the atheism in your heart. Everyone has, has to do battle with the sins that creep up in our heart of, of doubting, of doubting whether God is real, of doubting whether God is exactly as he has revealed himself uh, to be. So we need to realize that willful doubting, uh, sort of exploring doubts in our hearts willfully, that is sin. Uh, and we must realize that willful doubting will never result in more steadfastness. I think a lot of people, particularly young people, this is a huge problem. They think that they sort of need to rid themselves of their presuppositions that they were raised with if they grew up in the church particularly. They need to say, okay, I need to sort of strip myself of all of these presuppositions, and then I'll sort of, I'll, I'll examine the question of God. I read a really good book that dealt with this issue. It was called The End of Our Exploring by Matt Anderson. He said, the only context in which it's safe to explore, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but the way that I took his, his book, then I'll paraphrase it and summarize it here, the safest way to explore your, your questions of the Christian faith is uh, to essentially explore questions from the context of something like the Apostles' Creed. To assume that it's true and then to go out and explore issues, understanding that because you have received the faith that was once for, delivered to the saints, because you believe God's word is true, because you have accepted and because you're following Jesus, that you're going out um, assuming that Christ is Lord, that Christ reigns, and you, ex you explore questions and evidence out in the world, um, assuming that they're all going to prove that Christianity is true. That may seem like a priori reasoning. But I don't think we need to be afraid of that, particularly as Christians. Right? Christ is the Lord. He, he's, he has been raised. And he is the words of eternal life. So everything is going to prove, further prove, his glory, his truth, um, and uh, his goodness and his beauty. So you need to suppress the, the atheism um, in your heart. And then you need to seek the Lord with all your heart. So you talk about the duality of Christian duties. You need to push away atheism, run away from uh, practical atheism in your heart, and you need to run towards uh, uh, knowing God more. So Hebrews 11.6 is really the, the, the key devotional thought today. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So you must believe that God will bless and reward your seeking him. That's what the Bible says. So you have to believe it, and you have to live like it. God rewards those who seek Him. If you seek Him, you are doing His will. A lot of people say, you know, well, how do I know what God's will is? Well, here's an example of where God tells you. You know, His will for you is that you would seek Him. That you would seek Him. And so then, uh, we'll talk about a couple of ways you can do that. But before we do that, just to mention... Know then that when you are troubled by doubts, you are being tempted. When you are being troubled by doubts, you are being tempted. And if such doubting uh, discourages you, if such doubting weighs heavily on your heart, you ought to be encouraged that you're discouraged by doubts. Right? That, that means that there's a life in your, your, your soul uh, that recognizes that it's, it's a bad thing. So Brockle... Uh, ends his discussion on, uh, on the existence of God and the Christian life by saying this, and I'll just read it a couple paragraphs. He says, Do not yield to such thoughts, but resist them. Even if for some time you cannot rid yourself of these temptations, hold your inner convictions. That, that's, that's great advice. That you are in the battle, you're feeling weakened, what do you do? You keep fighting. Keep fighting for the same for the same cause, right? For the same commander, for the same king. Hold your inner convictions. As troublesome as it may be now, it shall make you more steadfast later. Persevere in reading God's word and join yourself to the godly in order to hear them speak about the delight they have in God. Great advice, right? We 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 shortchange the role that other Christians play in our lives. And often we neglect the personal responsibility that we have to talk about God when we're in the midst of other Christians. 
as a, as a source of encouragement. Right? That we really need to remember that. We really need to recover that as a, as a church in America. So persevere in reading God's word. Persevere in, in uh, being around godly people so that you may hear sanctified uh, speech about God. Then it, he says this, Refrain from reading books authored by atheists or those who encourage atheism. Avoid interaction and disputation with confirmed atheists. Now this I think about in terms of if you were, say you're a boxer, uh, you wouldn't go step out into the ring without first training. And I think sometimes a Christian would hear that advice and they would say, well, that just seems weird. Why wouldn't I? It seems like you're just wanting me to avoid even asking the question. But the, the, really the issue is one of strength and preparedness and training. If you're plagued by doubts, you are not the kind of person that ought to be disputing with atheists. If you are plagued by doubts, you are not the kind of person that should be poring over books uh, that, are, that are written to convince you that God does not exist. He says, instead, turn to the Lord by continually engaging in prayer. Right? If, you, if you doubt, ask yourself the question, how much have I prayed? If you're being plagued by doubts, ask yourself, how much have I prayed? He says, live in simplicity, knowing what the will of God is. In so doing, you shall grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. I know I've gone way too long today, and I, I, I am sorry. But I'll end by uh, sharing this prayer from David Clarkson. He says, give me faith, Lord, or I die. I may live without friends, wealth, honors, or pleasures, but I cannot live without faith. There is nothing but death for me in unbelief. Lord, whatever you deny me, do not deny me faith. I am lost, undone, I perish, I am a dead man without faith. I would have been better if I had never been born than to live in unbelief. Your wrath would weigh on me while I lived in this horrible state, and it would be that way forever. I will never see life unless I believe. There is no hope for me until then. My case is miserable and desperate until I believe, and I can never believe unless you give me faith. Lord, give me faith or else I die. It is miserable to be excluded from life, to be dead while I live. Unless you give me faith, I will never see life. What misery it is to be under divine wrath. How unavoidable the misery of those who are under abiding wrath. What joy can I have in any enjoyment when your wrath is mixed with all? What comfort can my life be to me if your wrath hangs continually over me? Lord, hear me. Bring my soul out of this mire and clay out of unbelief, out of the pit where there is no water, no comfort, no refreshment, and no relief. You take no pleasure in the misery of wretched creatures. It is no delight to you that I am miserable, but rather that I should live. Lord, give me faith, or else I will never see life. Give me faith, or else I will be forever miserable. Amen. What a great example of, uh, of engaging consistently in prayer um, and doing so so that God would, uh, would grant that which he promises in Hebrews 11.6, that he, he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him, and we cannot please him unless we believe that he is, and that we seek him in such a way. Thanks so much, and I uh, hope this was helpful to you. We'll uh, continue on in the coming weeks as we consider more directly certain attributes of God.